Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 64, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 64, 6 and 7. Behold, it is written before me, I will not, I'm sorry, I'm on 65. 64. Here we are. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself, to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we are all the work of thy hands. Be not wroth very sore, O Lord, neither remember our iniquity. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. May God bless the reading of his word. My father was a ruling elder for 40 years in the church. When I was a young man, I was called to the ministry at the age of 15. I began to have some very good discussions with him. And uh, late night, Sunday night discussions especially. And he would often say to me, I wish I could write this with an iron pen on your heart. And then he'd say some saying. And he did. <laughs> I, I never forgot those things he told me. And one of the things he told me when I was 15 years old was, when you become a minister one day by the grace of God, I want you to remember two things. I want you to remember that the greatest problem with nominal church members is worldliness. And the greatest problem with the people of God in the church is their prayerlessness. And later on, years later, when I went to get my PhD at Westminster Seminary, and I could actually begin to study in the primary sources, Luther, Calvin, the Puritans, and read hundreds and hundreds of their sermons as I grappled with the whole problem of assurance of faith. I asked myself this question. Why were their days so blessed and we live in such a day of small things? And of course, I, I knew the ultimate answer is the sovereignty of God. But why on a human level because I studied their sermons, and I was actually kind of surprised. I mean, the sermons were good, and they maybe were better than ours, but in terms of content, in terms of their essence, they weren't very much different from what we're trying to do in the pulpit today. But as I read, and as I read about their lives, I read about the way they spent their time, I gradually, gradually came back to what my father said. It's not just the prayerlessness of the people of God, however, in the pew. It's the prayerlessness of the ministers of God in the pulpit. You know, when I read stories like this, that Philip Melanchthon once came upon Martin Luther praying, aloud, of course, because Luther said, I always pray aloud for two reasons. Number one, because I don't want my mind to wander because I'm praying to the holy God of heaven. And number two, I want even the devil to hear what I'm praying. Because he's a defeated foe. Well, Melanchthon came around the corner and heard Luther pray one time, and he was very quiet, so Luther didn't know he was there. And he went back and he just wrote these words, Oh my God, with what holy familiarity and with what holy reverence did Master Martin pray.
Luther once said to Melanchthon, Philip, I've got so much to do tomorrow. I need to pray an extra hour. I don't know if you're like me, when I've got a lot to do in a day, my prayer time shrinks in like an accordion going in. What Luther is saying, his accordion was going out because he had so much to do. And you see the difference between these men of God, the Reformers and the Puritans, and most of us, I'm afraid, is simply this, that for us, appendix Prayer is an appendix. We, we tack on to the end of our lives like an appendix in a book. It's something we do when we got some leftover time. Oh, well, we pray a little bit in the day, stated times. But for Luther, prayer was his life. It was his life. Fast forward to John Knox's son-in-law. When he died, his wife said of him, he didn't say it of himself, his wife said of him that she estimated he prayed, I mean, don't even try it. It, it wouldn't be edifying because you'd just be a failure. But she estimated he prayed seven hours a day. I mean, seven hours? It's crazy. She said he never slept through a night in their marriage without getting up at some point to pray in this side, cold, northern room in Scotland. And she'd be so afraid he'd catch pneumonia, she'd, she'd get up and she'd follow him. She wouldn't dare open the door. It was too sacred, she said. So through the closed door, she'd say, John, honey, don't you think it's time to come back to bed? You're going to catch pneumonia. And he would respond, also through the closed door, Oh, my dear honey, I have 3,000 souls to care for. That was the size of his congregation. And I know not how it is with many of them. He'd be praying for them one by one in the middle of the night. Then fast forward to the Puritans. That was John Welsh, by the way. Fast forward to the Puritans. And you find the same thing over and over and over again. Not that prayer came easy to them. They wrestled with prayer as well. Puritan Thomas Adams said, there's, there's times in my life where I'd rather do anything but pray. But you get statements like this. Joseph Align, that great man of God who wrote that powerful book, An Alarm to the Unconverted, that God used for the conversion, literally, of tens of thousands of people. Joseph Align said this, Whenever my heart begins to grow cold in prayer, I feel like I'm a bird out of my nest, and I'm not content until I'm back into my old familiar way of communing with God again. Oh, to be at home with God in the inner closet. That's what we desperately need today. Prayer is a mighty weapon. It's the mightiest weapon. The Puritans said there's nothing greater based on John, based on Ephesians 6. And Paul Call it the weapon of all prayer, Bunyan called it, didn't he? In the valley of humiliation. You remember, Christian is laying there. He's, Satan is hovering over him, going to deal with him a final blow. And he picks up the sword of the word and of prayer and he sends Satan speeding away. You see, the gospel produces a praying people. People that cry out to God, not only, but people who cry out for God. And that's why the Puritans viewed Christian prayer as a holy communication between heaven and the believing soul. A spiritual exchange of the desires and praises of God's children for the blessings of their Father in heaven. And they learned that, of course, by the Holy Spirit, but they gleaned that from the Reformers who were such prayer warriors a century before. I love John Calvin's definition of prayer when he said, prayer is when I climb up into my father's lap and whisper my needs, my praises, and my confessions and thanksgivings into his ear. The Puritans gave their formal definition of prayer in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which expresses it well. Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to His will, 
in the name of Christ, with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. John Bunyan builds effectively off of this definition. And in his definition, which is the opening page of his beautiful little book on prayer, gives 11 ingredients in true prayer in one sentence when he says this, Prayer is a sincere, number one, sensible, number two, affectionate, number three, pouring out of the heart or the soul unto God, number four, through Christ, number five, in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit, number six, for such things as God has promised, number seven, according to his word, number eight, for the good of the church, number nine, with submission, number ten, in faith, number 11, to the will of God. I'll read it again without the numbers. Prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate, pouring out of a heart or soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit for such things as God has promised, or are, which are according to his word, for the good of the church with submission in faith to the will of God. The Puritans believed that praying is as natural to true Christians as breathing is to a living child. Prayer is essential. And what they aimed for in their praying was to truly pray in their prayers. Many of them picked up on the King James marginal note number one beside James 5.17 when it speaks about Elijah praying earnestly. The marginal note says, it can also be translated this way, Elijah prayed in his prayer. You see, James is using a Hebrew idiom intended to intensify the force of the verb. In other words, his prayers were more than a formal exercise. He was pouring himself into his praying. Alexander Ross observes, a man may pray with his lips and not yet pray with intense desire of the soul. You might call it prayerful praying versus prayerless praying. You say so many words. You know what it's like when you, when you pray but you don't pray. And you know what it's like, I trust, when you pray where you do pray. When you pray with heart and soul and you know you lay hold, like the old Scottish Puritans used to say, we pray on until we get the ear of the Lord of Sabaoth and lay hold of God. And that's what we desperately need today. And that's exactly, you see, what's missing so much today. It was missing, of course, in Isaiah's day as well. That's why Isaiah complained, speaking on behalf of God. There's no man that stirreth up himself to lay hold of thee. The power of the Puritan minister was that in his preaching, he spoke on behalf of God to lay hold of men, but in his prayer life, he spoke on behalf of men to lay hold of God. And how desperately we need that today. Puritans viewed prayer and preaching as their two-fold task, as the tremendous potential of their ministry. And for them, these were the two things they were called to do. And prayer was the first, according to Acts 6, verse 4. As one Puritan said it, the first task is prayer, and the better task is prayer. We are to give ourselves, brethren, give ourselves to prayer and the preaching of the word. But oh, when that prayer is there, how much more power there is to the preaching as well. Thomas Brooks, another Puritan, wrote this. Ah, how often, Christians, hath God kissed you at the beginning of prayer, spoken peace to you in the midst of prayer, filled you with joy and assurance upon the close of prayer. See, this is genuine praying. And the great possibilities of prayer should awaken us to the meager realities of our own praying. Is prayer the means by which we storm the gates of heaven and take the kingdom of heaven by force? Is it a missile that crushes satanic powers? Or is it like a harmless toy that Satan sleeps beside? How often do we experience 
prayerful passion for the presence and the power of God. I once got to go to uh, Switzerland. I wanted to really see Zwingli's church, and I looked forward to it a long time and got there at great expense to myself, and there was a big sign in front of the church that said, closed for repairs. And so I came three years later, and I was so excited. Now I could finally get to see it, and there was a sign in front of the church that said, closed for repairs. And I'm afraid that's what I struggle with myself many times in my own prayer life. It's like it's closed for repairs. And it's going to get better. And I talk to myself about it. And then later on, I look back and say, oh no, closed for repairs. But the problem is if we fail here, we fail in everything. The the reality of our ministry is, is seeping away as our prayer seeps away. How can we live to God in public when we seldom meet Him in private? Prayerless praying begins to cool long before reaching heaven. And it falls back on us as cold rain to chill the soul. While prayerful praying lifts us up into the light of heaven and warms the soul. That's why the Puritans often complained about their own praying as well. Thomas Adam frankly admitted, I pray faintly and with reserve merely to quiet my conscience for present ease, almost wishing not to be heard at times. Prayer and other spiritual exercises are sometimes a weariness to me. See, a prayerless person is ungrateful because he doesn't thank God. He's self-righteous because he doesn't confess his sins to God. He's self-centered because he doesn't ask God to bless other people. He's presumptuous because he does not pray even for his daily needs. He's irreverent because he does not pray God, praise God nor pray for his kingdom to come. And he's unfriendly to God because his prayerlessness evidences that he does not enjoy being with God, said one Puritan. You see, if your heart is absolutely prayerless all the time, well, of course, you're not a child of God. But if your heart is prayerless today, you are acting like you're not a child of God. Jonathan Edwards put it this way. He said, every time we sin, or Stephen Charnock said this, every time we sin, we are pretending in that moment, that God is not. And Jonathan Edwards said, when we don't pray in our prayers, it's as if we don't believe that God is omnipresent. Our prayerlessness is symptomatic of something much deeper, a greater problem. And we need to take hold of ourselves and take hold of God in prayer and not rest short of these things. But that raises the question, how do we take hold of God in prayer? And what I want to do in this talk is I just want to give you 12 practical points, six of them on how you can take hold of yourself, because taking hold of God implies taking hold of yourself in areas where you can take hold of yourself, and then six areas where we take hold of God in prayer. If we're going to truly Pray, if we're going to truly exercise thyself unto godliness, as Paul said to Timothy, and fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life, rather than living in a merely formal, nominal, internal closet prayer life. Number one, remember the value, remember the value of prayer. We need to remember, the Puritan said, five truths about prayer. Number one, prayer is essential for the well-being of your own soul as a minister. Number two, prayer is essential for you to fulfill your calling in your family, your church, and your nation. Number three, prayer is one of the most Christ-like activities you can possibly engage in. Number four, Prayer is God's appointed means of distributing the blessings of His kingdom and the gifts of Christ to His people. And number five, remember the Puritans say, James 4 verse 2, They who ask not, have not. Hence, unoffered prayer 
not unanswered prayer, is our greatest problem. You see, we need to value praying even when we do not see answers. It can be God's mercy to deny us His mercies of answered prayer in order to foster growth in believing submission to Him. In fact, face roots often grow deepest in the soil of unanswered prayer. William Carey, for example, labored as a missionary in India for eight years before baptizing his first convert from Hinduism to Christ. And yet in those years, Carey learned to live for the glory of God alone. He wrote, I feel that it is good to commit my soul, my body, my all into the hands of God. Then the world appears little, the promise is great, and God an all-sufficient portion. You see, God's delay became spiritual marrow for Carol's soul, Carrie's soul. And that still happens to us as preachers today when exercised in prayer by God's silences, we find more of God Himself. God is always greater and more valuable than His answers. And the greatest mercy is therefore to find God, not His mercies. And then we discover in our brokenness, in our need, in, in, in the multitude of unanswered prayers, that when we ask God for silver, God may wrap His silences in gold that never perishes. That's what led the Puritan William Bridge to say, a praying man can never be a miserable man, whatever his condition be, for he has the ear of God. I say, tis a mercy to pray, even though you never receive the mercy prayed for. I was speaking of my dad earlier. When I was nine years old, he sat me down one day and he said, I want you to know what the difference is between a believer and an unbeliever. And I hope you never forget this. A believer always has a place to go. What do you do when you're an unbeliever and you face cancer, you face a heart attack, you face even an, uh, a rather minor surgery? Where do you go? But a believer, even if you don't get the answer you want, has a place to go. An unanswered prayer can be valuable because it keeps you needy and poor and dependent, but it keeps you also in communion with Almighty God. But if unanswered prayers are valuable, how much more are answered prayers? Joseph Hall, very Puritan-minded, who stayed in the Church of England, but Puritan-minded in his practical theology, he said this, good prayers never come weeping home, for either I receive what I ask for, or I receive ultimately what I should have been asking for in the first place, which is better. Thomas Watson, the angel fetched Peter out of prison, but t'was prayer that fetched the angel. You see, we underestimate the value of prayer, don't we? All the time. And a woman in my congregation, she's unbelievably still alive now. She's been in the hospital dozens of times, all kinds of infirmities. She's very honest with me, loving relationship with her. One time she was in so much pain as I was saying, saying goodbye to her. I'd prayed with her and read scripture, talked with her, and we had good, good discussion. And I just said to her, out of, from the depths of my soul, I was trying to be compassionate. I saw her pain on her face. I said, I wish I could do something more for you. And she goes, I must rebuke you, Pastor. I go, rebuke me? Like, I'm trying to be loving here. And she goes, you just did the most important thing for me that a man could do on earth. You did something more important for me than any physician could do for me. You lifted up my worthless name into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Don't you go underestimating prayer, Pastor. Do we really believe in prayer when we pray, even when it doesn't get answered? We need to remember that in the waiting time between sowing and reaping, plants are growing. Keep watering every member of your church in that growing season with your prayers, even when you don't see a harvest yet. Number two, maintain the priority, the priority of prayer. 
Many activities have their special times and seasons, Ecclesiastes 3 says, but prayer is an activity for all seasons, says Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray without ceasing. Jesus was a model for that, wasn't he? He devoted himself to prayer. In his humanity, he grew weary from his labors, but he would rise early to pray in solitude even after a busy night's work in Mark 1. Sometimes he prayed through the night, Luke 6. And if the incarnate Son of God needed to pray often to his heavenly Father, how much more do we need to make prayer a priority in our lives? For we have to say, without him we can do nothing. And we know deep down that prayer is the greatest part of our spiritual warfare. It's the front-line battlefield. John Bunyan said, you can do more than pray after you prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you prayed. You've got to pray first, not last, not when you've given up. Commend every day, every activity to the Lord. Bunyan concluded, pray often, therefore, for prayer is a shield to the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge for Satan. You see, to prioritize is to rank some things higher than others. It's possible that your prayer life suffers because something else ranks too high. Does our social life crowd out our prayer? Is our use of electronic media hindering our prayers? Do you really have prayer as your priority? Is that the most important thing you do every day? Personally, the most important thing you do in your family, the most important thing you do for your church, most important thing you do for your nation. Number three, speak with sincerity, sincerity in prayers. Trust in him at all times, Psalm 62, 8 says, ye people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Sincere prayers can take many forms. Sometimes a sincere prayer, such as Psalm 119, is long and carefully crafted. Sometimes it's very short. Sometimes it's like Psalm 86, Unite my heart to fear thy name, or God be merciful to me a sinner, or Lord help me. But either way, settle for nothing less than genuine integrity and sincerity in your prayer. That's what God is looking for. Thomas Brooks, the Puritan, says it this way, God looks not at the elegancy of your prayers to see how neat they are, nor at the geometry of your prayers to see how long they are, nor at the arithmetic of your prayers to see how many they are, nor at the music of your prayers, or at the sweetness of your voice, or at the logic of your prayers, but he looks at the sincerity of your prayers, how hearty they are. There's no prayer acknowledged, approved, accepted, recorded, rewarded by God, but that wherein the heart is sincere and whole. The true mother would not have the child divided before Solomon. As God loves a broken and a contrite heart, so he loathes a divided heart. And you see, it's a sincerity of prayer that takes every part of our being to perform. Not only the heart, but also the mind, the will, the emotions, even our body can be involved as we turn to God in a real and intimate way and pour out our heart sincerely before Him. I have a very dear friend in Scotland. He's one of the best prayer warriors I know on the face of this globe. And he was telling me very confidentially, very privately, he says, sometimes I, I pray for 10, 15 minutes and I get off my prayers, I just give up. I, 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 can't, I can't get to God. I can't feel communion with him. He says, and then I, 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 I say, no, no, and I get back down on my knees and I say, I'm going to persevere until I lay hold of him in prayer. That's sincerity. I want communion with God. I don't want to just go through the motions. I want to lay hold of him. That begins with that conviction. I need to be utterly sincere and transparent and vulnerable in the presence of Almighty God. Number four, cultivate a continual spirit of prayer. That text I mentioned, Pray Without Ceasing, was once a subject of discussion by a group of ministers, Banner Truth 
published that book of minutes, by the way. I think it's out of print now. But John Newton was in there. Richard Cecil was in there. It was a group of 19th century ministers. And they got together, discussed various subjects. And one time they got together and discussed this subject. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? Because obviously you can't pray 24 hours a day. And different ideas were given. You can read the different ideas. But finally, one of them, they weren't satisfied. One of them asked the the young lady who was waiting on them if she knew what it meant to pray without ceasing. And she said, oh, sir. She said, yeah, that's not so difficult. When I get up out of bed in the morning, I I, I get dressed and I pray, Lord, clothe me with the righteousness of Christ today. I came down, I dusted the room, I prayed, Lord, take away all the filth of my heart today. And I I prepared for you your your snack and your your drink. I, I prayed, Lord, Feed me with Jesus Christ, who's, who's the water of life and, and the bread of life today. And yeah, I just kind of pray my way through the day like that, she said. And you know, that's, that's really it, isn't it? That spirit, that attitude to prayer. You know, when you don't have your stated times of prayer, the old Dutch saying was, when, when the form is gone, all is gone. We need that. But when you're really living a close life with God, isn't it true that you just find yourself spontaneously praying to God throughout the day? It just pops up in you without even conscious effort because there's a closeness there and you know you need God for every event. Everything you do in the ministry, you need God. One week after I was ordained into the ministry, I was visited by another minister, local minister in Sioux Center, Iowa. And I asked him, You've been in the ministry now, brother, for 40 years, and I'm just beginning this last week. Do you have any advice for me? Please tell me. And this is what he said to me. I've only got one advice for you, one piece of advice after 40 years. I knew it was going to be important when he said that. And he said this. Don't you ever dare to undertake one duty in the ministry or one visit even if it's to an old person you've visited year in, year out in the hospital, and you've done it many times, don't you ever undertake one duty in the ministry without crying out to God for help. That is critical if we're going to develop an attitude of prayer. So we need, yes, we need set times, and we need to saturate the routines of our earthly life with meditation on the relationship of things earthly and temporal to things heavenly and eternal. That's what that young lady was doing. And the Puritans had a name for that. They actually published 41 books on meditation and prayer. And some of those books were entire books on what they called occasional meditations. And what they trained their mind to do was to think about spiritual things and then lift up their hearts to God through natural things. So if they saw a doorway, they might think about, oh, Jesus said, I'm the door, and what a door means, it swings open. And they might think about how, in what ways Jesus is a door and how he's an opening to eternal life. And just sit and meditate on a door. We are so earthy. We are so bound to the physical. We've lost the art of meditation, and that has negatively impacted our prayer lives as well. Number five, organize for prayer. Organize for prayer. Now that's going to sound like a contradictory diction to my last two, but it's not, you see. We need spontaneous prayer, but we also need organization in prayer. And I I wish I could say I do this as faithfully as as I'm going to say, suggest to you, but I'm preaching to myself as well right now. I think what we need to do, if we're going to be serious as ministers about praying, is we need to regularly have stated times where we pray for our entire congregation. What I try to do is pray through, and I do it with my colleagues in the ministry, one page a day in the, in the church directory book, or one page a week at least, praying specifically for the needs of each family, each boy, each girl in that family. But there are so many other prayer needs of people outside your church. Martin Holt, a very dear friend of mine who's been taken to glory now in South Africa, he, he, he had a prayer stool in front of his, his desk, and he showed, he showed it to me. His, he became a very dear friend. And uh, I could see in the prayer stool where his arms lay across that stool because the wood was sunken down. Hour and a half, two hours every morning, he, he would get up at 5 o'clock. He'd have an hour and a half of intercession, intercessory prayer. And then he showed me his book. He had a whole bunch of people listed, everyday prayers, 
then some every week, and then some every month. According to the priority that he felt the need to pray for them. And he turned over that first page, and there was my name and my wife's name and all three of us children. And he said, I pray for you, your wife, your three children, individually, every single morning. Do you understand what that means? When you've got people praying for you like that, it's powerful. It's amazing. It's wonderful. John Newton said, one of my greatest comforts in life is that I know that somewhere around the world, someone nearly every moment is lifting up my name unto the Lord. What a comfort that is. You be that comfort to your people so that they know, they know you are praying regularly for them. And use, use other things. Use Operation World, for example, or Voice of the Martyrs, to, or whatever it takes, to pray for others also around the world. If we have to buy a map of the world and, and mark it up, we should, be, we should let our prayers go around the globe as well as penetrate individuals. Number six, use the Bible as your guide for prayer. The Puritans said this in the larger catechism, question 186, that the whole word of God is of use to direct us in the duty of daily prayer. You see, they believe that prayer is a two-way conversation. We need to listen to God through His word, not just to talk to Him. We do not listen to God to, by emptying our minds and waiting for a thought to spontaneously come to mind. That can easily turn into false mysticism, but we need to listen to God by filling our minds with the Bible because the Bible is God speaking in written form. And the more we fill our minds with Scripture, the more that word will saturate naturally our prayers. A heart soaked in Scripture will reflect the heart of God in its petitions. Thy kingdom come, as we've been hearing about the, the Lord's Prayer. Now, in these ways, there is a certain amount of discipline, isn't it? In these six ways that you need to take hold and I need to take hold of ourselves. And we need to get serious and stay serious about prayer. This is our calling. Act 6, it's why the deaconry office was established. So that we could give ourselves to prayer. But in taking hold of ourselves, we also prepare ourselves by the Spirit's grace to take hold of of God, to take hold of God. Like Jacob wrestling with the angel, not letting him go until he blessed him. So we must take hold of God. How do you do that? Well, let me give you six quick ways here before I close. Number one, exercise faith in Jesus Christ for prayer. Exercise faith in Jesus Christ for prayer. The same faith by which you get saved the same faith by which you come to God for your daily needs is the same faith you need to lay hold of Jesus Christ in your prayer. Puritan George Downame said that we must ask how it cometh to pass that man being stained and polluted with sin and by reason thereof an enemy of God should have any access to God or be admitted to any speech with him who is most just and terrible at consuming fire and hating all iniquity with perfect hatred. How, how is that possible? And then he answers his own question, Therefore, of necessity, a mediator was come to come between God and man who were reconciling us to God and covering our imperfections might make both our persons and our prayers acceptable under God. And so we always come in the name of Christ. We always come confessing in one way or another outside of Christ. We have no right to come. We have no freedom to lay hold of God. But we come in Jesus as Paul says, we have access to God, access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of Christ. Number two, we plead God's promises. We plead God's promises in prayer. God has bound himself by the promises he makes to us in his word. That's what the Puritans taught again and again and again. But that's only the biblical teaching. Psalm 119.25, My soul cleaves unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word, thy word of promise. 
Thomas Manton. One good way to get comfort is to plead the promise of God in prayer. Show God His own handwriting because He's tender of His own word. I have an old elder in my church. He's, well, he's not an elder anymore. He's 90, 93 right now. And, uh, but he was downsizing a few years ago and he brought me a spiritual letter, letter from my father. My father was converted when he was 28. And uh, this letter was written when he was 29. And it was filled. My dad was talking about how what the Lord had done for his soul. And, and I, I'm starting to read this letter and, and the elder says to me, I, I, well, I thought you might like to have it. You, you can keep it. I go, have this? I would love to have this. This is my dad's handwriting. You see, what, do you, what wants to be of God? When you, when you come back and you bring him his own handwriting and you plead his own promises in prayer, you lay hold of him through the channel of his own word, his own promises, which he has covenantally bound himself to you to fulfill. That's a beautiful thing. So you don't have to come with your own words. You come with his words. You know, sometimes when I get discouraged in my study, I've got, I've got about nine books behind me, just behind my chair. And they're the prayer books of, of great forefathers, prayers of Spurgeon, prayers of Edward Bickersteth, prayers of William J. And I just pick one of those out, and I just start reading them for a little while. And what I notice in all nine of them is that basically their prayers are almost entirely Scripture, interwoven in unique ways, but they're just praying God's Word, God's promises back to him. In fact, the Puritans went so far with this that they talked about suing God according to his own word. Now, that's pretty bold. John Trapp said promise must be, promises must be prayed over and sued in heaven's courts. God loves to be burdened with and to be importuned in his own words to be sued upon with his own bond. Prayers are putting God's promises into suit. And it is no arrogancy or presumptuous to burden God, as it were, with His promise. Such prayers will be nigh the Lord day and night. He can as little deny them as He can deny Himself. William Gurnall, prayer is nothing but the promise reversed, or God's word turned inside out and formed into an argument and retorted back by faith upon God again. And what is the greatest promise of the word? What is the sum of all the promises? But the gospel of Christ, crucified for our sins. So pray in the name of Christ, pleading God's promises, knowing that all the promises of God in Him are yea, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God. Number three, look to the glorious Trinity. Look to the glorious Trinity in prayer. Much of our prayerlessness and our prayers is due to our thoughtlessness toward God. We don't understand the immediacy of the Trinity in our prayers. We don't understand that God dwells in our prayers most when our mind dwells most upon God. And therefore, when we pray, we need to meditate on how the Gospel reveals the Father, the Son, and the Spirit through praying. Ephesians 2.18, For through Him, Christ Jesus, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. You see, prayer is a Trinitarian thing. Prayer is like a golden chain that runs from the Father through the Son and in the Spirit back to the Father again. Prayer is commanded by the Father, decreed by the Father, made acceptable by the Son, shaped into desires and words, by the groaning spirit within us, and sent back up to the Son, who through his intercession presents it as acceptable, salted with the merits of his own sufferings, purified, and made well-pleasing to his heavenly Father. So we lean heavily on the Spirit to help us compose our prayers, even as we trust in Christ to make those prayers effectual, and we rest on our Father's heart of love, who sent both his Son and his Spirit down from heaven to be a prayer giving, a prayer hearing, a prayer answering God. That's why John Owen said there are times when we can pray to distinct persons of the Trinity in his great classic, Communion with God. And what he argues is something very powerful. It's helped me in my prayer life, I'll say that. He said normally you pray to the triune God, but there are times when you pray specifically 
to a particular person in the Trinity because that person in the Trinity has as his primary task in the economy of the Trinity to do that particular work. So if you're really praying for sanctification, for example, since that's primarily the work of the Holy Spirit in your soul, that would be very appropriate time to pray directly to the Holy Spirit, that type of thing. Now, that's not to say that we make a radical separation between the persons of the Trinity. We don't, we don't do that. But we, we, Owen based it on 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. And he said God reveals himself particularly with an emphasis on those through those persons to our soul in those particular areas, even though there's overlap. Number four, believe that God hears and answers prayer. God really is a prayer-giving, prayer-hearing, prayer-answering God. And one of our greatest problems as Christians, the Puritans said, is that we don't believe it. That's not unusual. The New Testament church was praying that Peter would somehow be released from prison, and suddenly when he was knocking on the door, the servant girl was astonished, so astonished she didn't let him in, <laughs> and she just said, Peter's there! She didn't expect it. And we have that too a lot, don't we? When we pray and God answers us wonderfully, we go, I can't believe he answered. But we ought to believe it. One of, the, one of my favorite stories is a, there was a church with a tavern right next door to it, and the, the tavern was just, just a mess, and it was just terrible, and it got worse and worse. And on Sunday mornings, they, church people would often come and find vomit on the parking lot and refuse all around and, it became such a burden, the pastor said to the congregation, let's pray that somehow, somehow, God will deal with this tavern. And, uh, well, it wasn't long before a tornado came through town and wiped out the tavern completely and left the church standing. So the tavern owner took the church and the minister to court. And he said, these people prayed against our tavern. And the church people said, we didn't do anything, we didn't do anything. And the judge said, this is the strangest case I've ever heard. Unbelievers believing in prayer and believers not believing in prayer. <laughs> Number five, seek the glory of God. Seek the glory of God in prayer. You take hold of God by what we heard the other morning, by hallowed be thy name. When you're consumed with the glory of God at the heart of all your petitions, you're taking hold of God. James Fisher explains that God's name includes, quote, everything by which he's pleased to make himself known, including his names, his titles, his attributes, his ordinances, his word, and his works. That's why what Dr. Lawson said about Thomas Watson's table of contents is so important. God, I, I want the glory of God in every one of his attributes as I pray. Now, sometimes what we do is we make too much of a distinction, I'm afraid, between, um, what was it that Conrad Mbewe said, Grandma's foot and the glory of God. And we think they're antinomies, but as he said to us, no, we bring the two together in the Lord's Prayer, don't we? Now, if you really do that, you say, let's say you're praying for an unsaved son. How do you pray? Well, if you pray something like this, Lord, my son is unsaved. Remove the darkness from his eyes so that the glory of Jesus Christ might shine into his mind and enable him to repent and believe. Open his heart so that he will worship thee with a love that thou dost so richly deserve. Fill his life with holiness for thy glory. You see, you're bringing the needs of your boy and the glory of God together in those petitions. And when you pray that prayer, you're praying that the name of God will be made to appear great in the world through the conversion of your son. So that if your son believes, the fame and the reputation of our God will be increased. That's the way the Puritans saw it. And that's the way the great saints of the Bible, of course, saw it. When, when, when God threatened to, to just break ties with Israel, what did Moses say? Lord, what wilt thou do with thy great name? Save this people, because thy name is at stake. That's when you take hold of God when you plead, even on daily things, for the glory of his name. Now, number six, finally, rest with contentment. We take hold of God when we rest with contentment in God's all-sufficiency in prayer. 
God's all-sufficiency. You see, Christ comforted his disciples with the words, Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sometimes the greatest answer to prayer in our lives is the inward, quiet peace of God. The presence of the God of peace, as he calls himself. And this contentment is worth more than money can buy. I told you about my dad. He talked to us a lot as children about the things of God. It was wonderful. But my mother was the quiet one, the prayer warrior in the secret place. And she spent, she, my dad told me after, we got, after I got married that she spent at least two hours on her knees a day. I didn't know it was quite that much, but I knew she prayed a lot. But I don't know of another person in the world who is so content all the time as my mother. I remember asking her as a 10-year-old boy, Mom, if you could be any age, she was 42, I said, if you could be any age, what would you want to be? And she said, I want to be 42. I said, wow, what a coincidence. That's just what you are. <laughs> and she said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. It was just a quiet answer. I never forgot it. Contentment. Why in the world do Christians want to be younger? You want to be younger? Do you really want to go back to all those foolish days? Be content. And when you learn the secret life with God, and you put everything through the sieve of prayer, there's a contentment, because you really believe then that all things work together for the good to them that love God. And so you can handle any affliction. I've been wrestling with this whole thing of contentment the last four weeks with my eye, I tell you that. Sometimes I have it, sometimes I don't. I'll be honest with you, it goes back and forth. But contentment. Is it something that you treasure and you want it? You want it in God. You want to be one with the will of God. We take hold of God when we're one with His will. When our will, as it were, is swallowed up in His, not in a mystical way, but in a practical way. And we can truly say, thy will be done. Father, said one Puritan, I wait thy daily will. Thou shalt divide my portion still. Grant me on earth what seems thee best till death and heaven reveal the rest. That ultimately is what it means to take hold of God. Now I conclude with this. Let's remember, let's remember this. Not to aim so high. I don't want you to leave this place and say, I've got, I've got to go out and pray three hours a day or four hours a day. Not to aim so unrealistically high, such radical changes that we'll, we'll just simply go out and fail. But also let's not go out and aim so low that we think that God can't make us a real prayer warrior. God made Elijah a prayer warrior. And James tells us, to our comfort, that Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. Ask God to make you an Elijah. A prayer warrior in the sight of God. And in that prayer life, press on, even when you fail, by faith in Jesus Christ. Thomas Watson has a wonderful section in his book, in his chapter on meditation and prayer. And he says, some days you will just miserably fail. And you can meditate, and you can meditate, and you can meditate, and you can pray, and you just feel more and more miserable. Sometimes you just have to close off your prayer and you say, Lord, forgive me for just not being in the right frame today and help me to do better tomorrow. And move on. But don't give up. And if you've fallen, get up and do it again. No matter where you are in your spiritual journey, the greatest danger is to stop where you are and become complacent with your nothingness in your prayers. Press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And when your prayers are in shambles and you feel miserable, ask God for forgiveness and go back to prayer again. And do remember that prayer is nothing less than a journey into the heart of the Father following the way opened up by the Son under the guidance of the Word and Spirit of God. And if you've got a triune God behind your prayers, and in your prayers, and the apex of your prayers, God will teach you how to pray, and all shall be well. Take hold of yourself, and take hold of God. Let's pray. 
Great God of heaven, we confess our guilt. We confess our guilt. Our undervaluing a prayer. Our not seeing prayer as that great power that takes the kingdom of heaven by violence. Not seeing thy delight when thy child brings thee thy own promises and does take heaven by violence. Oh, open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds, open our inmost being to treasure prayer, to delight in prayer, to rejoice in prayer because we rejoice in Thee. Help us to commune with Thee, Lord, more sincerely, more earnestly, more zealously, more humbly, more believingly, more lovingly, more, more contentedly each day. Please make us men and women a prayer. Habakkuk's wrestlers at the throne of God. Don't let prayer just be an appendix to our lives. But let it be our life, we pray. Let it be our breath. In Jesus' name, amen.